welcome to the Cynical Developer Live. This is the podcast that helps you improve your development knowledge and career through explaining the latest and greatest in development technology, providing you with what you need to succeed as a developer. In this episode, we talk to Aaron Upright about creativity for developers. And yes, developers, you are creative. Aaron co-founded Zenhub in 2014 to help fast-moving software teams bring project management closer to code. Aaron currently serves as the head of strategic accounts while managing both strategic partnerships and customer relationships while helping current and prospective users get the most out of their experience with Zenhub. Previous to Zenhub, Aaron served on the team of the Vancouver-based venture studio Axiom Zen while he focused on developing go-to-market strategies for early stage products. It was here that Aaron founded Zenhub. So welcome to the Cynical Developer, Aaron. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to get you on. Um, I think that we're going to talk about a topic that most developers think don't exist. Um, so it might be a bit of a, a shot from the uh, from the left where they're not looking. So uh, it, it, uh, it'll hopefully um, inspire some people to uh, to be a little bit more passionate about what they do. Great. Yeah, now, sort of like a background on me, as, as some of the listeners will know, is that I come from a, a graphic design background. So I feel I've got creativity for designing nice UIs and a, and a good UX. Um, but um, it was it was recently, maybe last week, I think it was, um, I had a, a new starter at the current client that I work with um, who was watching me code. We were doing a bit of pair programming. And uh, he commented with, can I ask you, a question i said yeah sure he said um were you a designer or something in a past life and i was like yeah i was like why why because he said well you just spent the last 10 minutes lining all those things up and putting <laughs> all the all the variable names in, in a nice order and uh, things I was like all right okay so uh, i think uh, creativity is is definitely there and uh before we started recording um we, we'd mentioned that uh, different sort of avenues into becoming a developer or working in development. And, and uh, you mentioned that you were a business major, which is uh, a very different route in. Now, um, could you talk a little bit about that journey that, uh, that you went on that, that found you in software? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I'm probably the least obvious person from a background and profile perspective to start a developer to a company. Um, I actually did a year of, of engineering when I was in university, but then I dropped out and switched over, like you said, into a business program. But I've just been always really interested in the technology space and just more broadly, as you look around in the world, you know, how many different technologies kind of touch software and how integrated software is is a part of that. And so I always really wanted for that to be a part of my future and for that to be you know, my future career. So when I was in business school, I actually did a lot of courses that had overlap with engineering and overlap with, with CS. Uh, and it was there that I kind of really found out, uh, you know, this passion for working with developers, um, you know, understanding how development really works and, you know, started to really get into it from there. So a little bit of a less traditional angle where I didn't necessarily go to school for it and then kind of seek to kind of get into uh, this this kind of way of working or this kind of career afterwards. But I guess it kind of found me as, as I was really always interested and passionate about the space. Yeah, and I think... Uh... It's becoming more and more prevalent um, at the moment with uh, with some of these businesses that uh, they traditionally weren't software companies. They were companies that had a development department or a software department. And a lot of the clients that I work with uh, at the moment, they tend to be transitioning in, away from a traditional business and more to a software house that specializes in X, Y, Z piece of software. Yeah. I think it's really interesting because you're seeing more and more companies, you know, that are coming out and actually making those types of declarative statements um, like Ford, for example, saying, hey, we're not just, you know, an automotive company anymore. We don't just make cars. We're a software company. And that's how we're going to actually differentiate in the market. And that's how we're actually going to draw people to our vehicles. And so I think it's really cool how you're seeing a lot of companies, even in more traditional industries, you are really break out of that software is really becoming just the future of their business and how they think about, um, you know, the future of what they're building. Yeah. It's a, it's a change in mindset, isn't it? Uh, from a, for a business. And, uh, I guess that for a lot of developers, you know, 
we, we're talking or we're here to talk about uh, being creative as a developer. You know, developers don't really see themselves as being creative, but they are from day one building something and and that's what artists do you know they create something from nothing uh you're not maybe splashing paint on um on a canvas or sculpting clay but you're definitely sculpting code and putting code onto a canvas as such Mm -hmm. yeah i mean i actually think that by nature development or coding is is a really inherently creative task and like you said it's why a lot of people get into software development because they love building things and unless you're, you know, working at a company and you're working with a really old tech stack or like really old tools, you know, chances are you're going to be working on a really cool project and being able to use some really cool technologies. But I think where the kind of detractor from a creativity perspective comes in is really when you have to think about how you organize those commercial projects and really the process of organizing those development efforts. And I think that's, you know, really where the biggest kind of balance and trade-off between creativity and efficiency really comes. And I think when a lot of developers think about what really hampers that creativity or what brings them out of that creative moment, it's the fact that they have to really organize, you know, what it is that they're doing in a commercial aspect and really find ways of kind of working around that. So, yeah, yeah, th- there is that. I know I've had the the conversations with uh, with developers in the past because uh, we bring out uh, coding guidelines and things like that and go, "This is how you are going to write your code," yeah. and I've had people push back and go. Well, it's a creative process. Surely we should be allowed to do it however we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a really good point, right? Um, And it's it's always this fine balancing act of, yeah, we should be able to do it however we want, you know, but at at some level, there's standards, I think, that you need to think about, especially as you're coding in an environment with more and more people. And I think that's where we really need to get thoughtful about, you know, how do we not just empower everyone to go off and really, you know, do what works for them and, and be as creative as possible. We need to put some kind of guidelines in place when you start to really think about this from a, a team perspective or from an organizational perspective. But I think you also need to find a really careful bounce there because if those guidelines are too imposing, like you said, or if um, you know, those kind of uh, goalposts are, are um, a little bit too complicated, um, that's when I think you really start to get pushback from people. And that's where it really kind of impacts the creative process and really gets restrictive on people being able to do what they want to do and develop in the way that makes the most sense for them. Yeah, yeah, I I can see what you're saying there, but it, you know we have these particular tool sets that that we've got to use, and and they sort of impose on you uh, working in certain ways, and and then some some businesses like to use certain methodologies on how they approach their work. You know, mm-hmm. is, is this not something that um, that developers always have to adhere to, or is like you talked about a balancing act there? Is there is there a balancing act that, that needs to be done with that? I've been around a lot of successful projects. We've been around a lot of failed projects, but I've never really found that there's a particular correlation when it comes to the success or the failure of a, of a project with a particular methodology. And in my opinion, the best methodology is ultimately the one that you know, works for your development team and really balances that with the needs of the organizations. And when you start to think about what organizations care about, I think they care about predictability, they care about visibility. Developers care about moving fast, lowering those barriers to process. And so as we start to think about introducing process, I think we need to think about it in like an iterative way that ultimately balances those two camps. Sure. So what you're saying there is that, uh, is it that the agile is, is not the, the, the silver bullet that it, it's not going to, uh, not going to save every development team. If you go and you, uh, you adhere to all the rules that, uh, that, um, agile gives you. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think one of the most common questions that we get from our customers is they're, you know, adopting our product is, well, which agile methodology should we pick? There's so many out there, but like, what's the right one? And the question we always ask back is, well, what does success look like for your team? Like, do you have a clear picture of what that actually looks like and where you want to be? And I think when you step back and you actually think about what success looks like, that ultimately allows teams to take a really progressive approach that bounces speed and visibility and the need for predictability it balances the needs of the development team with the needs of the organization. So rather than saying, hey, here's a specific methodology, pick and follow this, you know, answer the question first about what success looks like for your team and then ease into the process from there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've, I've been talking to people um, quite a lot recently uh, about Agile and uh, I've, I've been talking to, um, to meetup groups about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, I have actually said to them, you know, that, People do see Agile as these hard and fast rules that you have to implement all of them, but uh, you don't. You, you need to implement what works for your business. And 
you know, don't necessarily prescribe to doing extreme programming or lean programming or, you know, one of the other million different types of agile that are out there, you know, come, come up with your, you know, your own solution, what, what works for you. Because I guess, uh, as you say, there, some of these methodologies mm -hmm. can actually hinder the, uh, the progress of the team and, and hinder delivery at, at, at the end of the day. And yeah. uh, I guess they get, they get in the way of the, uh, the creative process as, uh, as we're sort of, we're uncovering here that development is uh, is a creative process. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that because I think that a lot of teams look at these methodologies. A lot of teams even look at agile, um, you know, and uh, agile development as an all or nothing approach. You're right, we're either doing it or we're not. But I'm a big fan of teams like easing into a new process or easing into agile. And I think the reason for that is because it allows them to build really good habits along the way. As opposing to have to adopt, uh, as opposing to having to adopt every part of that methodology at once, and we've seen teams who have you know done things like started organizing work into sprints, for example. Which, when you kind of peel back from it, it's a very Scrum centric term. But they're not using uh, software estimation, or they're not using story point estimation to actually estimate the different stories and tasks that they're working on. And so, I guess from an agile purist perspective, you might say, well, that team's not really following the principles of Scrum. Um, but when you really think about it, you know, software estimation is one of the hardest things to do properly in project management and even in software development. And it can just be a lot of overhead for a new team that's, you know, learning a new process, um, trying to get, you know, started with a new way of working. And so, hey, if it doesn't work for the team and it's, it's ultimately going to end up slowing you down, you know, don't worry about implementing it. You don't have to implement every single part of Scrum if you want to look more like a Scrum team. And uh, teams shouldn't be penalized for kind of dipping their toes in and saying, hey, we want to work in a more organized way, but we don't want to adopt every single part of that methodology up front just because it's really process intensive. And we want to, you know, start, uh, you know, starting from the place that we're at, we want to walk before we essentially run. So I'm a big fan of, of taking that iterative approach and saying, well, what can we do today to get us started? Where do we ultimately want to be in terms of what success looks like for us? And then plot the path in order to get there. Sure, sure. So, do you have any specific um, methodologies that you that you follow with your teams to to make sure that they they get that um, ability to be creative, to to do what uh, they want to do, and and do what uh, makes them happy? Really, at the end of the day, yeah, that's a, it's a really good question because I think we've gone through even in our own development process a lot of different methodologies. We started off in a very um, disorganized way of working where we just had a, simply a task board and we were moving a lot of the things that we were working on back and forth between different pipelines. And then from there, I think we started to say, well, hey, that resembles a little bit more of a Kanban style process. So let's really try to limit ourselves in terms of work that we have in process. But as the team scaled, that kind of broke down because it, it became challenging to know, you know, what do I pick up next? What's the biggest priority from our development perspective? What should I be focused on? And so that's when we started to move towards more of a you know Scrum style process where we were actually holding some of these agile rituals and sitting down as a team and estimating tasks, talking about the complexity of what it was that we were building. What the common thread was through all of that, what I would really recommend to teams though, is that we talked about our process and we came together as a team and discussed where it was working and where it wasn't working. And we actually held a monthly retrospective on our process to figure out where we could actually make improvements and how we could make it work for our business as we were building Zen Hub. And I don't know if enough teams actually do that. I think a lot of teams hold retrospectives after their sprints and after they've shipped products, they bring the whole team together and say, what did we do well? What could we have done better? But not a lot of teams hold that level of retrospective or put that level of thought into their actual process. And so we found it very beneficial to sit down every month and literally on a list say, what's working? What's not working? Where do we need to improve? And that's what's actually led us down the path of iterating our agile process rather than saying, hey, the flavor of the day is Kanban. We're going to go try and, and model our process after that. We're seeing a lot of content and stuff that now says Scrum is the most popular approach. So we'll flip over to that. You know, the iterations that we've actually gone through in our own process have really come uh, as a result of feedback from the team. Yeah, and you know, I can speak to that, uh, having experienced that uh, exact same scenario. Um, I go into a lot of these businesses um, as like a team lead or a senior developer, um, and I sit down in these new new teams with a fresh pair of eyes, and they go, no, we're, we're on a an agile transformation journey. We're, we're trying to become agile. I go, okay, yeah, great stuff. Sit in these retrospectives, 
and nobody has any suggestions or nobody wants to to suggest any different ways of working but i always find myself sort of maybe uh championing some of those things you know are we maybe walking the board in a different way um are we approaching how we assign tasks uh differently you know what what can we do what can we change what parts of the process you were using uh, worked which parts didn't work and and trying to uh, get the the teams to uh, to engage and try and build that uh, that rapport up there and that trust with the team that you know these these meetings are a safe environment and you can uh, you can actually voice any concerns it's not a case of yes i am the agile uh, professional here that is taking mm-hmm. you on this agile journey and you have to do exactly what i say um you know the uh, the teams need to be able to to stand up and be counted and, and feel that uh, they can actually uh, make a difference in, to the uh, the processes that they're uh, they're supposed to be working to. Yeah, for sure. It's it's such a good point, and I think that trust is something that's so important in agile. As teams are moving faster than ever before, and I think to put it in perspective, you have to kind of think about where a lot of these teams have come from. And as we work with you know larger organizations, especially that don't necessarily have um, a background in software development or recently kind of transforming their business around software. Um, they're really moving from a way of working that didn't emphasize rapid iterations and delivering value to customers in every single sprint or in every iteration. In fact, a lot of these organizations really worked in you know, waterfall-centric ways where you deliver once at the end of the project and hope that what you've built actually satisfies you know, the needs that the customer actually has. And because there's that single point of delivery and a lot of checks and balances that happen before things ever go into production around that, that one single event, you know, Trust isn't something that is really you know, needed or built up as much. But with agile ways of working or with you know, more companies transitioning to work in agile ways, we're seeing organizations shipping software just far more frequently than they ever have before. I mean, we ship our own extension probably two or three times every single week. And so in order to do that, there has to be this level of trust because you can't possibly have sign off or people coming in and checking every single thing that goes out to production. And so that, that trust component is really, really important uh, when it comes to Agile. Um, and it, just like you mentioned, you need to have trust at the team level as well around these different rituals and different planning sessions that we actually have. Um, you know, we should trust that when we come together and we um, estimate how complex something is going to take or how long something is going to take, that that actually represents everyone, um, you know, in their, their actual opinion on that. Uh, and we trust the people in that room to say, Hey, if, if we think this is going to take three days, you know, if we think it's going to be this complex, that it probably is that complex. Um, if not, you know, that's where things really start to, I think, you know, get challenging in the agile process because then you have people coming in and scheduling update meetings or check in meetings. And that just becomes to tie it back really a killer to productivity, a killer to creativity. It ultimately really slows the team down. So we actually internally have kind of uh, created this informal manifesto uh, around what can we do to help build trust. And there's some really important parts in that that I think you know I would bestow upon other organizations even just to think about. One of them is encouraging transparency. You know, if we know we're not going to hit a goal, or if we know we're you know taking on too much work during an iteration, to so start to vocalize that. Um, another one is encouraging humility. We get things wrong all the time. You know, even having you know worked and built Zenhub for five years, we're still constantly learning something in the new. Uh, learning something new in the course of building. And so if we have to rethink our approach, let's rethink our approach. Um, let's not say, hey, we, we know everything up front uh, and we're not going to, to change. Um, another thing that we really encourage is adaptability. So if we are seeing things that change based on what we're hearing from customers, let's adapt and let's figure out what needs to be different. Uh, we actually try to get things out as early and often to our customers, you know, even in unpolished states to start building that feedback. And uh, knowing that if we need to be adaptive and change the approach, um, that we have the ability to do that. And then the you know, last thing that we really emphasize is accountability. And I think accountability is a huge part of trust because when someone says they're going to do something, you know, they become accountable for that. And you have to trust they're going to do that or else, like I said, you get back into this process of check-in meetings and updates, which is just a killer to productivity and creativity. Sure, sure. And a lot of these things, I think... Um... A lot of listeners out there probably are thinking, yeah, this all sounds great, but um, I don't know if I can bring this into my uh, into the company that I work for, for the corporation that, that I'm at. Um, mainly because I think that uh, that trust isn't there. They don't have that, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, sort of way of thinking in the business that, um, oh, culture. 
That's the word I was looking for. They don't have that. Cu- they don't have that uh, that culture that uh, that really sort of puts the onus back on the uh, on the developers and and, uh, and and likes to bring everybody in because at the end of the day, this this is a team game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, have you got any sort of tips for for how these people could could maybe uh, approach incorporating agile into uh, their business? Yeah, I think it's I think it's to really start and look at it in an iterative approach. You know, if you come into a business that isn't ready for transformation or that doesn't have a culture of, of kind of change or doesn't encourage that, and you come in with an approach that's really heavy handed and really different to the way that people are used to doing things, just by nature, it's going to be met with a lot of opposition. And hey, look, we still even see that in customers that we work with today, even customers that are more primed to want to use, you know, a, a project management tool like the one that we provide in, in that style of project management, where we, we still get pushback from people within these organizations that um, don't necessarily know that this is the best approach or, you know, are just purely resistant to change. So I think when I think about how you go through that type of transformation and how you really build that credibility, I think you start small and you kind of build over time. It's not about saying, hey, from day one, we're going to change everything over to, you know, to this new way of working. It's something that happens you know, over time and in different iterations. So I would encourage people that really want to start bringing more of these agile ways of working into their organization to think about what's the kind of smallest unit component that I could start with that would really kind of create that change. And then how do I actually build a movement around that? How do I build more process over time? How do I change the way that we build software over time? How do I change the tools that we use to build software over time? Um, because anything too quickly is just going to be met with a, a lot of different resistance. Yeah, and uh, you you mentioned early on that uh, the the primary goal of the business is to ship software, and mm-hmm. uh, and and probably a more important primary goal to them is to make a profit. That that's what they're there for. So there's, there's a, that fine balancing act of what does the team want to do? What do the developers want to do personally? What do the business want to, uh, what does the business want to do? And maybe what do their clients want? Um, and I guess that all of, all of this needs process. It needs a uh, particular methodology, particular ways of working, but I guess all of that sort of crams together and, and that uh, stifles creativity as well, because uh, we work into such tight deadlines, you've got to get things out. It's, uh, there's that end goal. Whereas uh, a lot of other creative uh, avenues, you know, you look at uh, painters and, and people like that, you know, they don't always have deadlines. You know, mm-hmm. they, they take years to, uh, to do some of these, uh, these fine art uh, pictures, but we don't have that luxury in, uh, in software. Yeah. And, and I think about deadlines in a really interesting way where it's like we have multiple deadlines across the course of this, right? And I think it's important for people, especially people in, a, in creative capacity to think about that as well. The first deadline that we have is usually when we want to launch a product, but that doesn't mean that when we launch something, that's it, right? This is, this is the beauty of these agile ways of working where there's kind of multiple deadlines that we're trying to hit over the course of actually delivering value to the customer. And so, you know, it's, it's an interesting point that you bring up around like, you know, creative types may not have deadlines and that creative process can take years sometimes to come together. That's still very true, I think, in, in building software and designing software you just may maybe along the way have to hit certain milestones um, in order to accomplish that. So for example, you know, in a feature that we're building, maybe the first iteration of it, you know, goes out, you know, on a certain date, but it doesn't mean that we're done after that or that we can't improve it or that we can't continuously add to that. That's kind of the beauty of, of building and shipping software is that we can always change and iterate and improve over time. So it, it, I think if more people think about, you know, not that initial deadline is like, well, that's where the creative process stops, but we have to kind of define a certain scope for what that initial deadline is, but we still have the ability and the freedom to be creative and change things and improve things after that. That's kind of really where the magic happens. And, you know, I think a lot of companies that are, are you know, transitioning to these agile ways of working from more waterfall centric ways of working, or even ways of working where there were no deadlines and there were no um, kind of hard and fast goals that the business needed to hit. It's a really important thing to keep in mind um, that the creative process and the development process doesn't stop when that sh- uh, software or that feature is shipped. It continues over time, and there's always time to come back and make those improvements and continue delivering that value. 
Sure. So one one thing that uh, that I've met um, quite regularly, um, I've actually complained about it myself, is is over tooling. People want you to use Jira. They want you to also update a Trello board. They want you to physically change something on a on a board as well. And in between that as well, if you could uh, also submit timesheets for every time you context switch, and I want to know exactly down to the the half minute, which minute you spent on which project. Um, where where is that safe zone where um enough tooling is enough tooling that it's not going to get in 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 the way because at some point you've also got to do your day job and actually write that software as well yeah and, uh, you know people get very um overwhelmed with the uh, the amount of filling this form here for x y and z reason yeah for sure I, I guess on the topic of tooling you know i'm a really big believer that the tool should support the process not the other way around you know tools should never be the primary consideration for when a team is figuring out how they want to work T, uh, tools come after the team really understands what success looks like and they've agreed on a process or have identified their their ideal way of working and so i think the best tools in the market today not even in project management but that you know support development tasks and support development teams you know are able to support a variety of different approaches um, you know, and they're really flexible. I think flexibility doesn't just mean that, you know, hey, you can do anything in the tool. Um, it means it's able to, you know, support different iterations or as your team starts improving or, uh, you know, taking on different ways of working that the team, uh, the tool doesn't need to be switched out or you don't need to constantly be jumping back and forth uh, as you try different approaches and you iterate on how it is that you want to work. And so I think, you know, a bit biased, obviously, but the tools that are going to win in this space are the ones that are built with that flexibility for the team and that extensibility kind of in mind. On the developer level though, when we think about kind of, uh, you know, tools, I think it really becomes about how do we minimize distractions and context switching for those people that are doing the work. And I think that's hugely overlooked in the project management space. You know, you mentioned a couple of the solutions, but when you really look in the market today, I think a lot of the tools from a project management perspective, they really sacrifice the experience for the software developer at the experience of other people that are using these different tools. And so when we think about project management or when we, we thought about, you know, how can we, we put a different spin on this um, or, or what, you know, would we, how would we design a project management tool if we could really do it from the ground up? We thought about it through that lens of how we could really just get out of the way and allow the people who are doing the work to be most productive and to, you know, work where they are um, and spend more time where they are. And that really kind of comes back, I think, to the concept of, of context switching, which is... As you mentioned, you know, people being forced out of the environments where they spend the most time, where they're the most comfortable to have to go out and update a tool or to update, you know, the status of what it is that they're working on somewhere else. And that context switching is particularly expensive and damaging for complex tasks and creative tasks where it's really hard for people to get, you know, back into those and back into that mindset. You know, for example, if, if I'm cleaning my apartment and I need to go write an email um, or take a phone call. I can get back into cleaning my apartment fairly easy. It's a pretty mindless task. You know, I don't have to really think about that. But if I'm trying to tackle a really complex problem, you know, that's like mathematical or algorithmic, and I'm pulled out of that to go into a meeting or to update a tool, it's really, really hard to get back into that. Um, you know, in fact, it's, it's likely that developers that have meetings every other hour in their calendar or back-to-back -back meetings, you know, or even with little separation in between, they're probably not going to get anything done for the entire day because... You know, the reality is that once you start working on something, if you're pulled out of that, it takes 30 minutes to get back in. And then before you know it, you have, you know, your next meeting or your next thing that you have to go and go and update. So when we thought about how do we create a better project management experience and, and how do we help people be productive and creative, we really thought about how do we build into the tools and the environments where people really already are to help streamline that process for them so that they're not forced to context switch away. They can stay in that zone. They can stay where they're most focused and where they're most productive. Sure. Yeah, you you, uh, you talked about um, the creativity uh, being interrupted there, and uh, you know that that is also people will talk about it as being in the flow or, or in the zone, mm -hmm. and um, that's something I've definitely uh, struggled with. Um, I used to do uh, one of my roles uh, fully remote, and uh, my uh, my wife wasn't quite um, used to it, so. Um, I used to use quite uh, quite often a technique called rubber ducking. I have a flip chart on the back of my office door and I would stand and I would explain things to a rubber duck or to thin air. And she would often come in and say, what, what are you doing? And she'd interrupt <laughs> that, that flow or I'd be sat coding and she'd knock and she'd go, 
um, because you're here, could you pop down to the shop? And I'm like, look, you've just distracted me now. It's now going to take me a good half an hour, an hour to get back into where I was. I need to to stay in that uh, in that zone. Um, you know, personally, I don't mind being distracted too much. I would rather a member of the team came and asked me something if they were struggling than uh, than um, sort of sat there and, and didn't yeah. do anything for three or four hours. But um that distraction is a it's a massive enemy of of being um uh, being productive uh in a creative way mm-hmm. yeah i think just as an organization when you're working with people i shouldn't even say an organization anytime you're working on a project with other people you know it always helps if you're kind of thoughtful of the headspace that that person is in if you need some of their time or if you require some of their time you know and that even comes down to you know other other tools and other ways of getting in touch with people as well you know we make a pretty conscious effort you know when we're at work to, you know, understand what people are working on and kind of the flow you mentioned that they're in. So before I go send three Slack messages to someone or before I go to their desk and kind of tap on their shoulder, you know, trying to put yourself in the perspective of what this person's working on, because if I pull them out of that, that can be a very expensive thing for them to have to get back into. And depending on what else they have going on in their day to day or what other meetings they have coming up, if they're really in that state of flow and they really have found that kind of productive place of, of work, uh, and they're really kind of, you know, churning out code or, or um, you know, uh, you know, doing a, a lot of work, um, you know, really being thoughtful of pulling them outside of that or bugging them while they're doing that. So I think uh, it's an interesting topic to kind of think about, too, especially because there's tools out there. I mentioned Slack, but many others in the market that make it easier now than ever you know, for people to get in contact with each other, whether it's a remote situation or whether you're kind of sitting in an office. And so. I think it's just important for people to be thoughtful of what you might be pulling developers and creative, you know, personas out of um, that they may be working on that becomes very difficult for them to get back into. Yeah. And some of those tools, uh, like we mentioned, you know, um, Slack and maybe uh, Microsoft Teams and uh, even Skype uh, to some extent, they're, they're often tools that are critical to uh, the team delivering uh, whatever it is that they're working on. But uh, they're also uh, an evil as well because you can uh, find yourself sucked into conversations on there. Yeah. Um, some businesses uh, allow you to have off-topic channels and you've just got to be very mindful that you don't go and spend uh, all day mm-hmm. talking about uh, cat pictures or uh, the, the latest sports scores or uh, things like that. So um, they... I think they're a necessary evil, but uh, you've got to be very, very uh, vigilant of uh, of how and, and where they're used. But I guess that's the, that's the same for for any tooling, really. Absolutely, you know, and I, I think to their credit, you know, a lot of these tools that are out there, you know, make communication really fun, and they give you a lot of different opportunities and and uh, a lot of different avenues and channels, um, you know, to to make that communication aspect fun. But you know, even if you bring it back, like you said, to uh, to tools just in general. I think it is really important that you you find that balance because you know even in non traditional communication tools, if you're using email, uh, you know, in a way that it's creating a lot of distraction for people. If you're using updates in a project management tool in a way that's creating a lot of distractions for people or constantly you know, tagging people on issues, um, now I'm not saying you know don't do that, but just it's I think organizations these days need to be even more mindful of of that um, as they're working with uh, you know developers and, and creative types. So. Yeah, um, and I think email is is always heavily overlooked by companies. Um, I, I worked for, uh, for for one client, and uh, I actually ended up spending most of my day either in meetings or answering emails. And then when I was asked, "Where's this project?" and I said, "Well, I haven't even started it yet," um, I got to the point where I informed the uh, the business that any internal emails I will uh, check i think uh, i did it at half past seven when i first got into the office and then i would do it at one o'clock after lunch but then i wouldn't check uh company email again yeah um, i had alerts that would pop up if it was uh, an external email so if clients were, were trying to get in touch with me or vendors or anybody like that i would reply straight away um, but that actually meant that i started delivering stuff and uh, i also took the uh, the chance to say um if you invite me to a meeting and I've got nothing to contribute, I won't turn up. If I find the meeting boring uh, and I'm not contributing anything in the meeting or I have nothing to say, I will get up and I will leave. Uh, and that, that helped me uh, 
to uh, to actually get stuff done and, and stay in that uh, zone and uh, in the in the flow of things uh, a lot uh, a lot easier. And I know that um, people don't uh, often have that that nicety of being able to do that. And it takes some um, some cojones to uh, to actually go to your boss and say, "Look, I, I'm not going to be involved." Mm-hmm. But that sort of I think brings it full circle back to being in that environment where you've got that trust uh, built up, where you can sort of step back and say, "Look." I'm bringing nothing to the table at this meeting. There's no point in me being here. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think, you know, the more that organizations can actually encourage that and encourage people to kind of, um, you know, stand up, and like you said, in that kind of respect, uh, you know, the more productivity they're going to get out of people ultimately. Because like you said, if people don't need to be in a meeting or there, there's no need for them to contribute um, or they feel like they're not going to be able to contribute, then ultimately it's, you know, it's, it's them context switching and you're forcing people outside of work that they might otherwise be doing you know, into those different scenarios. I think the one thing, um, you know, that, that is really hard to, uh, you know, kind of sacrifice is that around, is around like kind of planning meetings. And so, you know, typically we expect people to be present and contribute in those meetings because they do have an impact on the actual work that we prioritize or how complex we think things are. And it's really important, I think, that we have buy-in across the team as we're thinking about, you know, estimating the complexity of things or as we're thinking about what we need to prioritize or, if we're cutting scope from a particular project because we need to meet a deadline, what actually gets cut? So those, I think, are very important scenarios in which people need to be involved. But for everything else, um, you know, we actually encourage it a lot internally as well. It's like if you feel like you're not going to be able to contribute or you feel like what you're working on right now is more important than being able to attend this, then you're ultimately the best person to make that judgment call because you're you know, the person who is, is the keeper of your own calendar. You know best uh, you know, what, what uh, you're working on right now and how important that is. Um, so don't let us, you know, tell you what you need to be in and what you don't. Sure. So we we've, we've covered quite quite a few different uh, topics uh, today on the uh, on the show. But what we uh, are ultimately trying to say to uh, to you people out there listening is that what you do is a creative process, um, and it needs to have some sort of nurture. Uh, there to make sure that you're you're doing the right things uh you know you're using the right tools you're using the right approaches to um to your work now it, are there any tips that you could give to the listeners out there to uh, to be more creative and and to sort of further their creative careers yeah I, I would i would challenge people out there to just kind of really think about like where you're spending your time you know during your day and uh you know, I think if you're identifying areas of your day um, that are outside of that creative process or that you feel are not productive, you know, if you feel like you're in an organizational setting where you can you can challenge that status quo or where you can kind of speak up on those topics and matters do. And even if you're not in an organizational setting where that's kind of generally accepted, you know, as I kind of mentioned, there's there's ways that you can start to introduce change management and really start to think about that. So you know, we really found it effective. I found it personally effective to really go through and say, like, where do I want to be and where do I want to spend time, you know, today? What do I want to be doing? And look at what, you know, is inhibiting that. And if the majority of what you do in your role is is very creative and very kind of technical, you know, I think um, it's an equally important thing to do is to step back and say, hey, where am I spending my time? Where am I spending my focus? How can I be more productive? And then, you know, from that, um, really taking a stance on, on you know, how am I going to uh, be able to do that? And uh, if there are areas, like I said, where that breaks down or, where you're finding that it's tools that are holding you back or processes that are holding you back, you know, be transparent and bring that to the team. Because I think ultimately when we're all transparent with each other and we all have that trust with each other, that's when things actually get done. That's when process change happens. And ultimately the team, you know, improves in a way where they're able to do things better and faster. Yeah. Some, uh, some great uh, pearl, pearls of wisdom there. Um, for, uh, for the listeners to take away um unfortunately that uh, sort of wraps things up for us for today you know we were we're out of time but uh thank you for uh, for coming on and talking to us today about uh, creativity and and all these processes and methodologies and everything that gets uh, really crammed into our day that we we maybe don't think about too much and don't realize that they're taking away from uh, what we should be doing awesome thank you so much james i really enjoyed it yeah great i uh, I did enjoy it as well and um for the listeners out there if you want to get in touch with aaron all his details will be in the in the show notes including links so you can go and have a look at zen hub and how that could maybe improve your your process uh because we all need another tool right (laughs) um so uh and uh thank you 
to you all for uh, for listening to the cynical developer i'm james Slurart, and you've been listening to aaron upright talking about creativity for developers if you have any questions about this or any other episode then drop us an email a tweet or leave a comment on the website where you can find all the resource links show notes for each episode and if you enjoy this episode please leave a review on your favorite podcast platform itunes stitch whatever it is and help the cynical developer to reach more developers around the globe